Good morning, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. This morning, we have a very interesting policy session entitled, How Has a Decade of Extreme Monetary Policy Changed the Banking System? We've assembled a, a panel of experts who we'll introduce you to in a minute. Uh, but before that, let me just set the stage here. As you all know, the financial crisis changed the banking system. The resolutions that happened in the, in the crisis integrated commercial and investment banking like never before. They cre the, these resolutions created today's too-big-to-fail institutions. They great, the, the crisis led to greatly expanded Fed emergency liquidity support. Uh, the Fed became the lender of first resort instead of the lender of last resort. TARP temporarily nationalized the banking system, and the Dodd Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act to extend the federal government's post-TARP control over the system. It gave regulators extensive new powers and responsibilities over the financial system. Deposit insurance limits increased by a factor of two and a half, and the slow recovery triggered Fed QE stimulus, which created massive bank reserves, which required new Fed operating procedures. So this morning, we're going to discuss all these changes with a panel of experts. And instead of me introducing a panel of experts, I'm going to introduce our moderator of the panel. Alex J. Pollock is a distinguished senior fellow at the R Street Institute. Alex was previously a resident fellow at AEI, my colleague here, and president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. Alex is a recognized authority on financial policy issues, including financial cycles, government-sponsored enterprises, housing finance, banking, central banking, uncertainty and risk, retirement finance, corporate governance, and political responses to financial crisis. He's the author of Boom and Bust, Financial Cycles and Human Prosperity, numerous articles, congressional testimonies, and what is perhaps his most consulted work by those of us who know him well, known as Pollock's Laws of Finance. So with no further ado, or with further ado, here is our moderator, Alex Pollock. Thank you, Paul. And ladies and gentlemen, let me join Paul in welcoming you to our conference this morning on how has a decade of extreme monetary policy changed the banking system. You'll all remember the most famous line about the Federal Reserve from its uh, long-serving and former chairman, William McChesney Martin, which is that the Fed is supposed to remove the punch bowl just as the party is really warming up. But what about a Federal Reserve which spikes the punch when the party is warming up instead? Uh, or changing the beverage in the metaphor, consider the dominant personality in the Federal Reserve of his day, Benjamin Strong, who memorably said in 1927 that he was giving the stock market a little coup de whiskey a little drink of whiskey, that is. What a piker Strong was compared to his successor of seven decades later, Ben Bernanke, who gave the stock bond and house markets a barrel of whiskey. Uh, the Fed's long-term bond and mortgage buying spree, plus zero or so nominal interest rates, plus negative real interest rates, um, as we all know, has set off asset price inflations of notable magnitudes in stocks, bonds, and houses. And how about what it's done to the banking system? This amalgam of 5,787, as of June 30th, FDIC insured depository institutions with total assets of $17 trillion, which are equal to about 90% of GDP. Or we might argue that the banking system actually and properly understood includes the Fed itself, which is part of and an, indeed an integral part of the banking system. Uh, then we would add the Fed's $4.5 trillion in assets to the size of the banking system and we'd get a greater banking system, we might call it, of $21.5 trillion dollars or 112 percent of GDP. However we think about the banking system and the Fed, how have years of extreme monetary and bond market manipulations by the Fed changed the banking system? Our outstanding panel of experts 
uh, is about to tell us. And let me introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, first will be Chris Whalen, who is an investment banker, author, chairman of Whalen Global Advisors, focusing on financial services, mortgage finance, and technology. Previously, Chris was director of research at the Kroll Bond Rating Agency, co-founder of Institutional Risk Analytics, and was with the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, Bear Stearns, and Prudential Securities. Among his books is Inflated, How Money and Debt Built the American Dream. Uh, and as we uh, think about this topic today, we have plenty of money and debt uh, to consider. Second will be Norbert Michel, who is Heritage Foundation's Research Fellow in Financial Regulation, Financial Markets, and Monetary Policy, including reform of the Dodd-Frank Act and of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Norbert, I wanted to say that since both Dodd and Frank were big proponents and supporters of Fannie and Freddie, these two issue areas go very well together. Um, Norbert also focuses on the best ways to address credit difficulties of large or too big to fail financial companies, as Paul said, and on the issues concerning the role of the Federal Reserve, as we'll be discussing today. Next will be Nellie Liang, the Miriam K. Carliner Senior Fellow at the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. Nellie is also a consultant to the International Monetary Fund and is a member of the Congressional Budget Office's Panel of Economic Advisors. Her research specialties include financial stability, credit markets, and the intersection of monetary and financial policy. Uh, just on the topic of today, she was previously director of the Office of Financial Stability Policy and Research at the Federal Reserve Board. And finally, we'll have Paul Kupiak, whom you know. Paul is a resident scholar at AEI who brings his iconoclastic insights to the study of banks and financial markets, issues of systemic risk, and the impact of financial regulations on the U.S. economy. Previously, he was director of the Center for Financial Research at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, chairman of the Research Task Force of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, and held positions at the International Monetary Fund, J.P. Morgan, and the Federal Reserve, and, as you know, he's the organizer of this, con of this uh, conference, for which we all thank you, Paul. Uh, each panelist is going to speak with opening remarks of 10 or 11 minutes, after which we'll give the panel a chance to exchange views or clarify points, and then we will open the floor to your questions, and we will adjourn promptly at noon. Chris, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Alex, and uh, thanks very much to Paul and AEI for uh, organizing today's session. We've had a lot of fun over the years considering various bubbles, and today I'm going to talk about the banking industry and how it's been affected uh, by monetary policy, not just over the last decade or so, but uh, really over many decades. Uh, and I think that's actually some of the most interesting uh, things to talk about. Um, first and foremost, just top level, the Fed is part of a much larger effort by global central banks to essentially take both public and private securities out of the market. Uh, they buy them using reserves from banks or, or money made up out of thin air. Uh, but essentially, they're taking duration out of the market. If you think of it in technical terms, uh, it's kind of like Jurassic Park. You have these big dinosaurs all looking for earning assets to put on their balance sheets, and there's less and less available. And this is a, a deliberate act of social engineering that says that if we can't get you to borrow and, and engage in economic activity merely by lowering the suggested price for benchmark interest rates, then we will forcibly change uh, the pricing of risk and thereby get investors and intermediaries to, to boost uh, employment and consumption and the rest. It's a totally neo-Keynesian perspective and I think also one that has been largely discredited by the, the published research, which is why it's so interesting that the central bankers persist. I think the obvious uh, observation is that uh, debtors are the beneficiaries of quantitative easing, particularly public sector debtors. So you know, this very quickly, this, this chart shows us issuance. And you'll notice the big, big green bars. That was mortgage securitizations during the 2000s. We were doing trillions of dollars some quarters. Uh, countrywide was the leading issuer. And we were literally turning over bank balance sheets several times a year. 
with mortgage securitization activities, and it has declined almost by half now. It has been replaced by the U.S. Treasury, whose issuance has gone up dramatically, and also by corporations who use issuance in the low-rate environment uh, provided by the central banks to buy back their shares. This is not very productive activity. This is Zytec, as, as practiced by our friends in Japan many decades ago. It's exactly the same. So when people say we're not Japan, yes, we are. Uh, and I think it's very evident from the record bond issuance we've seen in the U.S. bond market over the past five years. Spreads, this is the, the chart from our friends at the St. Louis Fed. You can see the big, big surge in high yield spreads during the crisis. The real object of, of monetary policy, and I think Chairman Bernanke understands this, was to get spreads down. Because spreads, particularly high yield spreads, are what tells you if the economy is working or not. Um, today, they're quite low very tight. In fact, so tight that I would argue that many banks, larger banks, have a hard time making money. When you think that Citibank has a 1.6% gross spread on their commercial and industrial loan book, and at the average cost of funds for that bank is 72 basis points, that's not a great business. You know, you would assume that those are reasonably decent credits in that portfolio, but still, they're not getting paid enough. The average for most FDIC-insured banks is close to 4%. And the big banks, Wells, the rest of them are twice city. And even then, they're still not making a lot of money. So, you know, we, I think, know uh, in general terms what's been going on for the last few years. But the key thing I think we have to accept is that over the past 30 to 40 years, going back to Chairman Volcker, the use of lower and lower interest rates to, uh, to goose um, economic growth has had a cost, and the cost you can see in the return on earning assets for banks, which used to be well over 1% and has since declined down to around 72 basis points. Even though the system's getting bigger, they're making less money on every dollar of assets. And that's why, especially for the larger banks, that tend to have relatively low spreads, dependence on non-banking activities, securities, uh, derivatives, et cetera. They, they're almost pressured to get into exotic activities because they don't make money on core businesses, especially the retail side of the bank. And this is, again, this is partly demographics, partly monetary policy, but it, it does have an impact on bank behavior. This is derivatives. You can see JP Morgan, the top red line, but now the blue line, Citigroup, is once again the largest derivatives house on Wall Street. And when you look at their business mix, when you look at the fact that they've sold their mortgage business, they've sold asset management, there isn't a lot left to the bank. So in this environment, again, where it's difficult to generate returns and get large assets to feed these very large balance sheets, um, they tend to go back into synthetics. And in fact, Citi just announced that they're going back into collateralized debt obligations, which are a purely synthetic asset. Notice the yellow line at the very bottom, that's the average for all large banks in the United States. Most of them don't play in derivatives. It's a highly concentrated market, the top six banks or so. In fact, you could argue that Citi and JP probably face each other on more than half of their trades. So the, the, it's the snake eating its tail in many respects. Now, just quickly, think about the schizophrenia of the Fed on the one hand trying to boost activity through a variety of means, and the prudential regulators, on the other hand, through Dodd-Frank and the Basel Accord, telling banks to take less risk. And in particular, the guidance that's come from regulators over the past seven, you know, 10 years, really, has been avoid default, and I want to see lower loan-to-value ratios on commercial loans, construction loans, this sort of thing. What that means is that there's less leverage in the economy. If I, as a home builder, have to put up 50% equity on all of my projects instead of 30% or less, which I could have done before the crisis, I'm going to build fewer homes. And that change in the structure of leverage throughout the U.S. economy gives you less growth. It's basic Irving Fisher 101. But you know they don't really think about this. There's nobody who gets everyone into a room and says, what do we want? Because I think you know there were so many aspects of policy that were not connected and were not thought out. Unfortunately, one of them is we have less leverage on the book today. And I think that's why it's so difficult to get growth to where people think we ought to be. Now, this again is another part of the story. How did the Fed keep the banking system 
alive? Well, two ways. They drove the cost of funds down to almost nothing. At one point, it went down to single digits. You know, if you look at the top of that red on line. basis points. It, it, well, on basis points. But <laughs> no, no, it was in actual billions of dollars, too. The, the cost of funds for U.S. banks around the time of the crisis was about $100 billion a quarter, and it went down to less than 10. And that is money that's transferred directly from depositors to the banks. And the same thing in the marketplace. The cost of funds dropped, so debtors had the advantage of that. And earning assets for a while were a lot higher, which boosted the, the returns for the banks. But to see you know, how it's, it's, just, it's barely $20 billion this past quarter. So that gives you some measure of just how much transfer there is. It's, it's around $400 billion a year. It's a lot of money. Now, the thing that really keeps me up at night is I see uh, signs of skewing that we saw during the 2000s, but it's even more pronounced this time. And this has to do with both residential mortgages, commercial real estate, and also some other asset classes. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this is all bank loans. You can see loss given default, which is charge offs, less recoveries, is actually pretty low, 75% for the entire uh, six, seven trillion dollars in loans on the, on the U.S. banking industry's books. Um, you can see there's been periods when it was also very low, but those, if you look at it, that was the roaring 2000s and then back in the early 90s, none of which were particularly good periods. But again, when you watch this, it gives you a sense of what's going on in the underlying loan markets. Now, this is one to four family mortgages. One to four family mortgages are at the lowest net loss rate that we've ever observed. And I think this is two things. This is home prices have been going up double digits in many markets for years, far higher than the uh, reported inflation rate, but the Board of Governors refuses to look at it uh, in part of their uh, deliberations. The other thing is, again, there's less leverage on the book. The LTVs of current production mortgages are lower than they were before the crisis. So I think that may be a factor as well. I haven't been able to isolate it, but I, I suspect there's more than just you know, toppy home prices involved here. This is, I think, an even more striking book. This is construction and development. Construction and development loans are almost not on the menu for banks today. The regulators have told them not to do it. Uh, after the crisis, the portfolio got cut in half from about $600 billion to literally $300 billion. A lot of those loans were charged off or paid off or whatever, but the banks were discouraged from going back there, and they've been told to have much higher uh, amounts of capital from the client than they would have required previously. However, look at the numbers. They've been skewing for quarters, which means that when a loan defaults, they're making the entire loan balance back plus. They're actually making money on default. And again, that tells you that there's a buyer standing there to purchase that property when the developer runs out of money. There's no cost to credit. And again, this is a red flag. We haven't seen this since the 2000s. But look how much more pronounced it is than at any other period going back to, to 1990. Now, what's interesting is the commercial and industrial loans, which is a big chunk of the bank balance sheet, it's uh, $2.6 trillion, are actually edging up. I can't tell you why, but I think given the run on uh, really uh, exuberant credit that we've seen over the past five years with you know double B and single B credits out issuing debt as though they were single A's um, you know maybe we've literally run out of customers in this case and we're starting to see some of the default risk that is buried under the comfortable blanket of low interest rates you know if you're not charging people anything for a loan it's very easy for them to carry it but if they have to start actually paying the loan and they have uh, you know, inferior resources, and they're going to show up as a default. And then finally, uh, the trend, you know, people keep talking about rates going up, and they do flutter up, but I think the dominant trend, even with the Fed stopping their purchases and, and, and changing some of their behaviors, is going to remain down because the other central banks are not going to stop. Uh, in fact, the purchases by the ECB and the Japanese will more than continue expanding the total nut of assets owned by global central banks, even if the Fed were to start selling. You know, just as an aside, I spent a lot of time in the mortgage business. We're down 30% year over year because of the movement of the Treasury uh, after the election. Most of the refi market just went away. And it, and it was long in the tooth anyway, but the pricing change killed it. You, the Fed could be selling $50 billion a month easily 
in mortgage-backed securities without affecting the market at all. In fact, I think they could do double that. But unfortunately, the folks at the board, for whatever reason, have taken this extremely cautious approach. I, my view personally is that they should have been kind of coming out the way they went in. You adjust the portfolio first, and if the market tells you the prices go up, fine. But I think current policy today is, is distorting the markets, even as they try to normalize things, because they don't understand the impact that they've had on mortgage-backed securities, on options, and on other aspects of the market that are very important. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Norbert. Thank you. Oh, oh, here we go. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me today. Uh, so I, I had this interesting conversation with a colleague the other day, uh, and it's the third or fourth time that I've had one in the last few years, or, or the last four years. And uh, it, it, it essentially went something like this. He said, well, I don't understand what the big deal is with the Fed and interest on excess reserves. They're paying a quarter point. What, what's the problem? That can't do anything. Banks can earn a lot more than that. They're not going to divert resources. This is just silly. I don't get any of this. And I said, well, I, I don't agree with that, David, and there's plenty of reasons why, and his name's David. Uh, so, and, and rather than get into the, the difference between uh, the marginal cost, excuse me, the marginal cost of the loan and the average net interest margin, I just said, you know, they're not paying a quarter point. They haven't been paying a quarter point in almost two years. Uh, actually paying one and a quarter point. Now that's an overnight rate, okay? So that's an, that's an overnight rate for banks to park cash at the Fed. Uh, and if, if you look, it, it's not only uh, a, above what many other rates, uh, overnight rates are, it's above what many other, what we would call safe assets are, uh, what, what those rates are. And you can go, you can look at one month treasuries, you can look at three month treasuries, you can go out to a year uh, to get close. Um, you can look at uh, one month CD rate. You can play around with this too. I'm not just trying to hide the, the early portion of the crisis. Uh, if, if you look at um, other CD rates, and I can't get a continuous uh, series off of Fred, but basically what you see is for the entire period that the Fed's been charging, or I'm sorry, paying interest on excess reserves, it's been doing so at an above market rate. With the, with the very narrow exception of when the policy was first, first implemented it's been paying an above market rate on an overnight rate relative to term, longer term, safe assets. Uh, so the, the idea that it wouldn't make any difference uh, is a little fishy if you just think about it in terms of what they're paying relative to what else you could get in the market. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of hit on that as, as I go through here. Um, of course, the Fed's been doing a lot of things. They've been doing uh, one of the two of the bigger things, I think, are the repo program and then the interest on excess reserves. All of that is in the face of, of course, the QE programs that Chris alluded to. Um, just to give some idea of the scale, uh, and Alex talked a little bit about this, uh, if you look pre-crisis, uh, fairly well back historically, you're, you're talking about the Fed's balance sheet being in the neighborhood of about 10% of the commercial banking sector, ballpark. Uh, that spiked up, and it spiked up again uh, later on in 2014 with the other QEs. And it has come down a little, but it has not come down very much. It is still over 25%. So it's been up around 30%. Uh, in other words, the Fed has held assets roughly equal to one third of the entire commercial banking sector. That's not having a minimal footprint in the market. Uh, that's, that's having a major footprint in the market. And of course, most of that is with the treasuries, uh, uh, longer term treasuries and mortgage backed securities. And if we check to see, you know, sort of where this shows up in the banking sector, you can look at the monetary base and the monetary base was on a slightly upward trend, of course, going back to the eighties. Uh, but you have a very large spike uh, during the initiation of these programs. And you have both the quantitative easing programs and the emergency lending programs. Most of those were temporary, most of those are gone, but some of the spike in, in between uh, the crisis and now is due to the emergency lending programs as well. Uh, if you look closely at the balance sheet, uh, 
Uh, you'll see that most of this is, of course, or maybe you don't know, maybe of course isn't the right term, but most of this is in excess reserves now. And uh, with this sort of monetary base, typically you would see much larger creation of broader money by private banks. And we don't see that. Uh, so that's a, that's a big difference now. And this is, it's not the case it's not the case that the banking sector has been shrinking. If we look at the deposits that are flowing into the banking sector, we know that that's up. And it's a, it might be a little hard to tell uh, from, from back there, but if you look at the decade prior to the crisis, the trend was about double. In other words, deposits in the banking system just about doubled. And then from the crisis to now, again, they've just about doubled. Um, so. Something in the transmission mechanism, the monetary transme transmission mechanism, is definitely not the same. Uh, and this is, you, you can break this down by small banks, large banks, foreign banks, domestic banks. You pretty much get the same trend. Uh, but when you look at the money multiplier, and I'm not saying that this is a policy lever. I look at this as this is just what it is. It's a quotient. Uh, if you look at this as sort of how much broader money has been created relative to what that base is, again, you see a, a long-term downward trend, but you see a cliff. And you see a cliff here in 2008 that probably in history has only been matched by something that you saw around the Great Depression. It took about 30 or 40 years for it to get back on trend then. And it, it seems like it's starting to come up a little bit now, uh, but it's obviously nowhere near where it was. So what that means uh, in, in layman's terms is that banks are doing something else with their funds. There's a lot of funds in the banking system, but banks are not doing what they normally do as banks. That has changed. Um, and you can see that if you look at other measures as well. Uh, prior to the crisis, the, the Fed funds market, you can split it out or you can combine it with repos or you can split repos out. I just went with one slide, put them all in there, uh, that's off the cliff. They're not doing Fed funds lending anymore. That's a completely different market now. They're not doing repos with other banks. That's completely off the table now. What are they doing? Well, oh, and, and you could do this with small and large banks, domestic and foreign, it's pretty much the same trend line. Uh, so what are they doing? Uh, cash on the on your right axis and uh, loans uh, loan share on your left axis so if you look at the bank balance sheets and you look at sort of the shares of where their assets are uh, cash is now huge relative to what it used to be uh, it was on a downward trend down below about th or right around three percent of the balance sheet three percent of total assets uh, and it spiked up to almost 20 percent it has come down a little but uh, it, it's still obviously well elevated compared to where it was pre-crisis um, and and you can see uh, in towards the the right side of this graph as the loan share drops that's when the cash share is rising uh, again, that, that is what's going on. They are investing more, if you will, in cash. Uh, you can do the same thing with treasury, uh, treasury and agency. If you wanted to do like a safe asset measure where you lumped cash and treasuries all in there, you kind of get the same effect. Um, you just, it doesn't, doesn't really show up on the graph as well, but it's kind of there. And then if you just go ahead and look at uh, cash and line it up with excess reserves, it's almost perfect. It's almost one for one. Uh, the Fed funds market, I probably should have stuck this one back a little further, but as I said, lending into the Fed funds market is dead uh, compared to what it used to be. Over 200 billion, it's now right around 50 or 60 billion dollars uh, per quarter, and it has not come back at all. Um, if we look at this and try to summarize this really quickly, um, think about the pre-crisis system. Everybody would talk about the Fed funds market. What was that? That was banks lending and borrowing to cover their reserve needs. They don't need to do that. That's totally gone, completely gone. The only thing that's happening now is that GSEs are lending into the Fed funds market. Banks are taking and borrowing that and then putting it at the Fed and earning the IOER, interest on excess reserves. That's all that's happening in the Fed funds market. So the transmission mechanism, which depended on those reserve balances and keeping those reserves relatively scarce, has fundamentally changed. Banks are not doing that at all anymore. 
and they are investing a large portion in the cash, a larger share of their balance sheets in cash than they used to. Um, that's a very different sort of monetary control aspect for the Fed. The Fed, as a uh, regulator of liquidity in the economy, has been doing that by simply putting piles of cash there. Thank you, Norbert. Uh, I only want to say that the reason the transition mechanism doesn't work like a mechanism is because it isn't a mechanism. It, it's an interaction of, of financial uh, entities driven by financial minds and strategies, and, and we keep fooling ourselves by thinking that the Fed operates a mechanism or machines, and none of these things are machines. They're markets, which are a different form of reality. So much for my footnote on the, on the very interesting presentation. Nelly, and welcome to uh, AEI, yeah, Nelly. Glad and to I don't disagree, this. Alex. Okay, well, thank you very much for um, having me here today. I think I um, will offer a slightly different perspective. Um, so hopefully it will make the conversation interesting. So I'm going to talk today about monetary policy, banks, um, and financial stability. I'm going to take this broader financial stability perspective since the reason we care, the primary reasons we care about banks is because we expect them to provide credit to support the economy, and we want to prevent systemic fallout if any bank were to fail. Banks per se, just thinking through, we don't really, they are doing, they are behaving differently now. The pre-crisis period is not the right benchmark at which we expect them to behave, so just to put that in perspective. So I want to make two points. Um, extraordinary monetary policies, in my view, have improved financial stability, not undermined it by supporting growth. And two, I think today banks are strong and they are viable and brought more broadly, financial stability risks are not high. Um, there are risks that are increasing given the high asset valuations um, and the imminent start of the exit from unconventional policies. So to make my points today, I'm gonna just start with one slide here on uh, a framework for financial stability. Um, so I'm gonna start by defining what we mean. So a common operational definition is a financial system is stable if it doesn't amplify adverse shocks and create negative spillovers, which then can significantly increase downside risks to economic growth. That is, we think of a stable financial system as one that's resilient, that can continue to perform its functions even when it's been hit by um, reasonably large negative shocks. What this definition does is it highlights that financial stability risks reflect the interaction of two different factors. One is shocks and the other is vulnerabilities. And of, you know, trivially, bigger shocks and bigger vulnerabilities mean bigger financial stability risks. So in terms of what shocks are, they're sort of the things that are always possible that you can't really predict or control. So think of oil price shocks, eruptions in geopolitical tensions, Greek debt crisis and the like. Um, as they're hit, as they hit the economy, they're transmitted through financial conditions and then to economic growth. But the effects of these shocks can be much sharper, they can be larger, they can be more prolonged if there are serious vulnerabilities in the financial system. So these vulnerabilities could be like high bank leverage, low liquidity, um, high le maturity mismatch or liquidity mismatch, or even just like high debt burdens for borrowers. So when these are high, they can generate fire sales, investor runs, and these have negative externalities. For example, when uh, Lehman, for example, couldn't even repo treasuries to fund itself because of its leverage, that revealed these fragilities or these vulnerabilities. And so what you can see from this framework is, you know, financial stability is not the same thing as low market volatility. Um, and this research is, is consistent with that that finds sort of a volatility paradox. Um, periods of low volatility can, through endogenous risk taking, lead to higher volatility in the future. And that's the kind of um, framework you work and try to avoid. So let me turn then to the current assessment. That sort of sets the stage. So I um, currently view financial stability risks not to be high. 
despite the extraordinary monetary policy measures, including quantitative easing. Um, financial vulnerabilities in the core of the financial system are low to moderate, and this is consistent with what the Fed has said in its monetary policy reports and previous uh, FOMC meeting minutes. We know financial leverage is low. We know capital is high. Um, and non-performing loans, as Chris has shown, have declined substantially as banks dealt fairly quickly with legacy assets and the economy has been growing. And second, banks have ample liquid assets. So we don't have a lot of risks from run risk or short-term wholesale funding markets. So this particular chart shows for U.S. banks, all banks, commercial banks, that even with the higher capital and liquidity requirements, uh, banks' return on assets, and this is all assets, not earn, um, eligible assets, have been steady about 1% per year in the recent years. This is lower than the pre-crisis periods, but if you go back, it's not um, unusually low. And to the right, the net interest margins have been falling, and they are quite low, but they are three percentage points. Note that the decline has been has been falling for quite a while, and not just during the period of extraordinary monetary policy. So this reflects partly that yield curves have gotten much less steeper as inflation has fallen and inflation risk premiums have come down. So this gives a sense of the sustainability of the U.S. banking sector. On the credit side, which I don't show a chart, uh, banks have also been extending loans. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Loans have been growing about 7% a year. This is despite mortgages that have been extremely weak. So if we look more broadly at credit, so this is all credit to um, households and businesses. So it would come from banks, markets, et cetera. You can see the credit, and then I scale by GDP, which is just a scaling metric. It's Think of it as income. The credit to GDP ratio for households, and that's this blue line that peaked um, in 2008 and 9, during the recession, that that line had been falling for quite a while. It's now flattened out, and then the orange line is for the business sector, and that's credit to GDP has been rising um, for the past few years. And the right chart just transforms this into growth rates, and this is the three-year rolling average growth rates. And the orange line again, business credit's been growing pretty quickly. Um, and we know that some parts of the business sector have increased their debt ratios significantly. And these kinds of higher debt burdens suggest there could be some vulnerabilities that are rising in the system. So what has um, attracted a lot of attention in recent months is, um, is the Fed's assessment and market participants' assessments that asset valuation measures have really increased. Um, and many are now elevated by historical standards. Um, and many observers, including notable academics, policymakers, and I would note Raghu Rajan in particular, have been very critical of extraordinary measures taken by central banks because it could lead to financial excesses that may not translate to spending growth. Um, in particular, it could generate reach for yield behavior by investors who have nominal, minimum nominal return targets that could lead to um, buying assets just to meet these targets and pushing assets to unsustainable levels. So there's two valuation measures that I show here. Um, first on the left are corporate bond spreads, and I think Chris showed these earlier. Corporate bond spreads are narrow. Uh, the red line is the one for junk bonds, speculative grade bonds. They're below four percentage points now. This is the 10-year, um, which are near historic lows. Generally, when they get this low, investors um, compensation for risk is, is uh, viewed as inadequate. Um, to the right, Treasury yields are low. So the top red line is the 10-year Treasury yield, and the green line is um, an estimated term premium. So that is currently below zero. Um, these kinds of uh, measures, low term premiums and low risk spreads, suggest that there is potential to fixed income investors to be that losses will be larger than expected because the response to any price shock, to any shock, will definitely be larger. But putting all this together, I see the U.S. financial system is much stronger. Credit is growing, but, we do, but there are asset valuations that are high. 
So in response to the initial question of whether extraordinary monetary policy actions of the past decade have harmed banks and financial stability, I would say no. Um, my view, monetary policy has reduced risks to financial stability by strengthening banks and borrowers. Um, it has lowered interest payments and increased collateral values, which has a re effectively reduced debt burdens and improved bank balance sheets. Of course, this was done in combination with regu new regulations, financial regulations, and with changes that firms willingly took on their own to change their risk management practices. But combined, monetary policy and financial stability, in my view, have achieved what is a positive feedback loop, which is strong banks and a strong economy. That said, I do think there are some risks um, that could increase financial stability in, risk in the future, future quarters. Um, certainly, QE was done with the intent of reducing term premiums and raising the prices of risky assets, but exit from those policies definitely carries some risks. And given asset valuations, the risk that any overshoot is larger than expected is higher. Um, while the Fed is doing what it can by being transparent, announcing, and being um, on a regular schedule, shocks by definition are unexpected. Um, high asset prices, another factor. High asset prices may, can lead to increased leverage, may have already leverage or maturity or liquidity mismatch. That is not easy to see, not easy to observe. So it could be that vulnerabilities are higher than we actually think they are. And finally, increased pressures to significantly scale back financial regulations, I think, could jeopardize resilience of the financial sector. Um, but to summarize, I believe that extraordinary monetary policies have improved banks and financial stability, um, not undermined it. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Paul. Thanks, Alex. So how has a decade of extreme monetary policy changed the banking system? Uh, quite a lot, I think, actually. 2008 financial crisis created today's too big to fail financial institutions. Um, subsequently, they've been come to be known as systemically important financial institutions, or SIFIs. In response to the, the financial crisis, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act, which gave regulators new powers over and responsibilities. They had regulators have exercised these powers in the form of new capital, liquidity, compensation, macroprudential regulations with the goal of reducing systemic risk. Now, under the Dodd-Frank Act and the regulations that have been imposed under it, the largest SIFIs, the largest financial institutions, have actually shrunk. Some actually shrunk in nominal terms, some in real. So this particularly colorful 3D picture, I went back to the beginning of the Y9C data, which is the holding company data, and uh, the, the last date online, which is the first front row of, of blue columns there, is actually 2012 quarter four. And in 2012 quarter four, I took the four largest bank holding companies, and those are the names below. And then what I did was I tracked where they were size-wise until the last data point, which is 2017 quarter two. And so since 2017 quarter two is the green uh, columns in the very back, the column right in front of that, the dark blue, would be 2016 quarter two. So those are annual snapshots. As you can see, the largest institutions really haven't grown very much at all. If we go in terms of growth, by the way, AIG is missing from this batch because AIG didn't actually file any uh, holding company reports until 2013. You can also see the GE capital disappeared before the end, as did AIG. One thing to keep in mind is that the, the SIFIs that didn't have uh, major deposits uh, are the ones that either restructured to get out of SIFI designation and the, and the regulations or, or litigated uh, in the case of MetLife. So if you didn't have a lot of deposits, um, you, you tended really to be unhappy as a SIFI. Um, these are the compound annual growth rates. Now in the top box here, um, I have the growth rates of the sort of macro economy. The first one is sort of the compound annual growth rate over the period of uh, non-financial, non-corporate liabilities, 
The second line is the non-financial corporate liabilities, and the last one is household credit. And you can see they've grown five, five and a half percent. These are nominal numbers. And if you look at the SIFIs, which are the ones that are either negative, Goldman Sachs, uh, Bank of New York Mellon, HSBC, they actually shrunk in nominal terms. Citigroup, uh, JP Morgan, Bank of America grew at less than the inflation rate, one, 1.2 percent. So the regulations uh, imposed in Stodd Frank have really sort of kept the largest of the institutions from growing, whereas the regionals, Capital One, PNC, they kind of grew on pace with the economy. U.S. Bank Corp, the large regionals seem to grow about the same rate as, as credit in the economy, uh, but Dodd Frank kept kept the biggest uh, shops from growing. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think it would depend on who you ask. I think if you went and asked Senator Warren or Senator Sanders, they'd probably think it was a pretty good, pretty good outcome. I think if you had cornered Jeb Hensarling and he was willing to talk to you, he would say, not so much, not, not a very good outcome. Did the largest SIFIs constrain growth, constrain economic growth, or was it the reverse? Did the constrained economic growth constrain the SIFIs growth? To the best of my knowledge, no matter how hard you try to beat the data, I do not think econometrics can identify which of those views is correct. I just don't think uh, the, the data analysis can I cleanly identify which side is right. Now, if we go to the banking system, equity is up, and those are the headline numbers that the regulators always tout, but the biggest change in the banking system is the use of deposit funding. Now, what I have here is my, uh, my creation, my living, breathing <laughs> banking system, and if you click it again so it continues to run, it, what I do every quarter is um, I take a histogram of the deposit to asset ratios of banks over a billion dollars. Uh, I wish we could get that to move again. I spent a lot of time trying to get that, trying to, get that to move, and cool. my technical guys are supposed cool. to be having that move. Um, somebody click on that downstairs and get it to move. Uh, Anyway, every quarter I smooth it with what's known as a kernel density estimator, and then you can actually watch the banking system change through time. And you probably missed it earlier, and if they clicked on it again, <laughs> that, whole, that whole thing that looks like an inchworm will crawl to the right. It will crawl to the right. Okay, click, go it, watch it. crawls to the right as we move through time in a very noticeable way. And, it, and, it, and there's a couple of factors that make it crawl to the right, so I think that's pretty cool anyway. That's, <laughs> If it were closer to Halloween, that would be my Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened? Why did banks increase their funding? Um, well, in 2008, the Fed started paying interest on bank reserves, while at the same time, it had drove customer deposit rates pretty close to zero. In 2012, there was a new deposit insurance assessment scheme introduced. The change was mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act. Back, banks now are charged premiums based on total assets, less their equity, instead of on their domestic bank balances, deposit balances. This allowed banks, the largest banks, to expand their use of deposits without paying anything extra for deposit insurance premiums. So if you look at small banks, um, and these are, these are small banks, smaller banks, they already used a lot of deposits in their capital structure. Uh, the bottom charts in the left column are banks less than, I can't even read it from here, so you can't. They're the smallest banks, 500 million. In the right charts, 500 million to 1 billion. And you can see they increase their deposit funding. Those are the up, that's the upper row. A little bit, but not a lot. In the bottom is what happened to their equity position. So their equity went up a smidgen, and the, and the scales are not the same. So the equity really went up just a tiny, tiny bit. If you go to the bigger banks, though, you can see the changes are quite dramatic. The blue line is December 2007. The red is 2016. And you can see what you saw before. Uh, the largest banks are all the, are the panel column all the way over in the far right, and they're banks by different sizes. And you can see the larger banks really started using a whole lot of deposit, fund, deposit funding, and the deposit funding was replacing wholesale liabilities, things that run when banks get into trouble. So they replaced their, their wholesale uninsured liabilities with deposits. So you can actually do fancy econometrics on this, and I did it. And um, what you can find in a, in a bank fixed effects regression with hundreds of thousands of observations is just what we said. Uh, the smallest banks increase their use of deposits a little bit, about 3.9 3 percentage, percentage, percentage points. Deposit to asset ratio went up. 10 to, 10 to 50 billion went up about 12.25, actually the biggest number. And the largest ones went up 7.6 percentage points, or 
thereabouts. So, I mean, the banks took on a lot more. Now, um, okay, let me go to the next slide. So, why does this matter? Okay, um, uninsured wholesale bank funding is the canary in the coal mine. Wholesale money runs when banks get into trouble. When the people like Denim, when they smell the sign of trouble, wholesale money runs. Deposits, not so much. Deposits run a little, but nowhere near like wholesale money. It was the wholesale funding run in the last crisis that started the you know, Fed and regulators that alerted them to they had a problem. They really didn't even realize subprime mortgages or any of this other stuff were a big deal until the, the wholesale money started to run. Monitoring by wholesale investors brings banking problems to the fore much sooner than regulators do who monitor. If you identify something more quickly and, and address it more quickly, chances are you're going to have less losses. The, the longer you let losses fester before they're identified and something is done about them, the bigger they tend, tend to become. So when they're hidden, the problems get, get bigger before they get addressed. So was the regulatory solution here to take the canary out of the coal mines? Was this intended? Well, when I talk to folks in, in the mutual fund industry, they say, yeah, it was. The Fed really wanted uh, banks to get rid of CP, and they, did, they wanted to keep mutual funds from buying CP, and they really wanted, uh, wanted to get out of wholesale funding because it caused them so much difficulty last time. In her testimonies, Chair Yellen calls the system safer because banks have increased their use of core deposits. But core deposits are another name for government insured deposits, i.e. taxpayer-backed funds. So what we have here is, the, with this new balance sheet mix, the taxpayer is, is really on the hook for, for banks more than it's ever been, right? The deposit to asset ratio is up close to 10 percentage points, while equity to asset ratios are up 1.8 percentage points or two, so on balance, Deposits are, are a way bigger, way bigger percentage. So if, a ba if the banks get into trouble and the taxpayers have to stand behind the banks, we're not any better protected than we were before the rice crisis. We're in a worse position. There's not, wholesale liabilities are not there to, 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 to take losses if a bank should fail. So when, when, we, when we talk about this, it's not just the taxpayers on the hook. The taxpayers are actually paying the bill. So here's a kind of ironic math. If you think the Fed IOR payments, they're going to co they cover all this and even more. So at 1.25 percent, given the reserves in the in the banking system right now, the Fed is paying banks roughly 30 billion annually. It's 29 point something billion. Now the interest rate that banks pay on their deposits, according to the FDIC National Survey, which comes out one one once once every week, it's four four percent on uh, checking accounts and six percent on savings. So let's call it six percent. And let's put it on about $11.5 trillion, and that's about $7, seven billion annually. Okay, so there's $7 billion. Deposit insurance premiums in 2016, they were a hair under $10 billion, so that's about $17 billion. So banks have $13 billion left over to cover regulatory costs, regulatory costs of Dodd-Frank. Now, what does Dodd-Frank actually cost to implement? Well, nobody really knows. There's numbers. The, uh, uh, Bloomberg did a piece on it earlier in the year, and they had estimates of the total cost of implementation over the first few years, and they ranged between 2.9 billion and 36 billion was the upper one, but that was the total cost of implementing all of Dodd-Frank over many, many years. Once the implementation's put in place, the ongoing annual cost of complying with Dodd-Frank is, is a fraction of that. So, yeah, I don't know, call it Call it five billion, call it what you want. I don't know, maybe Chris or somebody has an idea. But here we've got IOR payments, more than compensating banks for the interest that you and I get on our deposits, the deposit insurance premiums that banks have to pay the FDIC every year, and probably all the regulatory costs of Dodd-Frank. So uh, through Fed IOR payments, taxpayers literally are paying for all these things. We, they, we literally are. And this is back to who left the SIFIs. Okay, who left the SIFIs? It was the institutions that had no deposits. AIG, they just got out last week. Um, GE Capital uh, restructured so they could get out. They didn't have much of a deposit base. MetLife has, no depo ha has very little deposit base, small SNL. So the institutions that had no deposits and got no IOR payments for the Fed are the ones that really found this system that we put in place since the crisis so onerous that they had to get out of the financial business altogether to get out of the SIFI designation. So um, 
I think the banking system's a lot different than it was. The deposits are now a source, a source of revenue. They're not a cost to the bank. You, deposits make their, their money. So when they look at return on assets, uh, somehow deposits look like an asset now, I, I guess. But I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Paul. I think it's a tremendously important point to remember that, that quote, stable deposits mean government, guaranteed deposits mean taxpayer risk. It's a great, a great link. I want to give the panel a chance uh, before we get to your questions, um, to either uh, react to something somebody else said or uh, provide alternate views or just expand on, uh, on the points that you want to emphasize. Two or three minutes uh, each. We'll just go down the, uh, the uh, panel in the same uh, order. And uh, Chris? Oh, thank you, Alex. The thing I think of listening to the presentations this morning uh, is that the, the solution that comes from Washington every time there is a market problem is to reduce the market. Um, going back to 1998 when the SEC changed the rules for non-banks to sell uh, pass-through securities to money market funds, the objective there was to prevent systemic risk. The only problem is, is that that created a monopoly on short-term funding in the United States for banks. And this was done deliberately. The SEC staff, who didn't like to be inconvenienced, uh, decided to hand the tar baby to the Federal Reserve Board, thinking that the world would be better. Uh, and in fact, no, non-banks need to have a way of raising money separate from the commercial banking system. Otherwise, you get 2008, which is when Citi basically took their monopoly and ran the bank into the ground. You know, with uh, Michelle, too, the Interest on excess reserve, yes, they shouldn't have raised the price. They don't understand what they're doing in this regard. They should have unwound the physical intervention in the market first. But this just shows you how regulation and how rule by experts, as Alex has taught me over the years, inevitably goes wrong because they don't know what they're doing. And so when you replace a market mechanism uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the word mechanism. But <laughs> when, when you replace the market in capital letters with the discretion of a bureaucrat who doesn't have at all perfect knowledge, you end up with a situation like we have with reserves, which should, generally speaking, be well below the market rate unless you see one of the big banks exercising market power and forcing rates down. And that was the one thing I've, I've talked to both Michelle and George Seligan about, which is that there are times when the Fed should be able to pay above market rates as when they first started and rates were just about zero. Because you know what happened the next day? There was a bid above JP Morgan and Wells. And if you were a small bank selling funds in the market, that was kind of nice. So anyway. Thank you. Norbert. I, I suppose I would possibly think about conceding that maybe for a day they should pay an above market rate, but otherwise, <laughs> uh, but, but otherwise, if you're going to implement a corridor system, Chris is right. I mean, this all over the world, other central banks, you see this, it's, it's below. It's but this not is above. the thing, though. And if you have government-sponsored monopolies, how do you fix it? <laughs> oh, no, no I, we, we're on the same page there. I mean, I don't, I don't think the system should still be in place. I think they should shrink. I think they should get all this stuff out. Um, they have to balance the contractionary and expansionary forces that they've created now uh, to, create, to, to not create a disaster. But I don't, I don't think they should keep the system going. Um, the only other thing that comes to mind for me to sort of point out is that I don't really disagree with Nelly in the stability sense. Uh, that, that the banking se sector could be more stable right now, but that brings to mind uh, a, a Jerry Dwyer, uh, a friend of Paul's and I, uh, a, a Jerry Dwyer story, which is uh, about, I think it was a 14th century Irish graveyard, and it, it's very stable. Uh, there's just not much going on there. And, and that's how I think of this. I mean, you've got an enormous pile of cash uh, sitting there earning government interest, and yeah, nothing really is going on there compared to what could be going on there. Thanks, uh, Nelly. Um, so a couple comments. Um, I think, again, I, th I think about what banks try to do and what they fundamentally do is take funds from savers who want access to their money when they want it and try to lend it and that's gonna be longer. So you've got this inherent mismatch in maturities. So you do need deposits that are with an insurance scheme. Either that or you just, I mean, 
open to the idea that you have no, no insurance. But if you have deposit insurance, you're working in a system like that. Um, more deposits versus less is not necessarily bad. Um, but that's what banks do. I mean, they sort of try to find money. The other thing that they do, which is other than lending, is they offer transaction services. Um, so I think a lot of the deposits have gone to the banks, um, partly because they've left the money funds. Um, I, don't ne I don't see that as being an absolute negative. Um, on the IOR or the IOER and the payments um, to banks, what you will hope for is that the Fed at some point can reduce that range. So I agree that the payments on reserves are higher than the bank's funding costs. I, they're probably higher than the rates you earn on checking. But you know, a market rate could be like, say, 1%. But if then you add the, you know, the capital requirements, the FDIC insurance premiums, they are paying for a little bit more. And there probably is a gap. And over time, I think the Fed should, if once they get the system in place, and it's a very new system for them, they might be able to narrow that gap. That you know, instead of one to one and a quarter for the range, it could be, you know, one point one two five and one and a quarter, and then there would be much less the funds large being bank given to the. About half a point. What's that? The large bank cost of funds average. On average, right? But the marginal cost, which is what we should. I mean, they are reserves. They have to fund them somehow, and so you are. You know, it is an asset that has to be funded on the liability side. So, there. Um, you know, you. I agree that to narrow it, but it's not, you know, just like entirely the whole 1.25. Okay, those are my comments. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so if, if we go forward, I mean, the Fed has had this argument that, uh, well, bank deposit rates, customer retail rates are always slow to adjust, um, and, and eventually they'll come around. Well, we've been paying interest on reserves now for almost 10 years, and they haven't adjusted. So that's pretty slow, uh, and I'm not willing to wait another 10. The other thing is, if the Fed, as the Fed normalizes its balance sheet, and you believe in the New York Fed's president's words, uh, they're going to keep excess reserves around a trillion, around a trillion dollars, and the long-run dot plot path for the for the rate IOR rate is three percent. That's still 30, 30 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. The way I see it, the Fed has a political problem going forward. I, I don't think any of this was intended. I think they got into this position trying to do all the right things, but I, I think they're now I, I, in a bad way. Uh, most people don't understand that IOR payments are taxpayer payments. They're, 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 they're payments that would lower the federal government deficit if they weren't paying it to banks, and it's a transfer payment, plain and simple, to banks. And I, I think it more than covers their cost of deposit funding, deposit insurance, and the cost of now regulatory compliance. That's why the biggest banks, uh, when they were, uh, you know, asked, did they like the Choice Act or not? They said, no, we're we're quite happy with Dodd Frank right now, and and they're going to be happier as, as the Fed raises interest rates. So, so I don't see this as politically, you know, sustainable long term. Um, it, it still could go on for a long time, but I think it eventually, there's a day of reckoning where where people kind of figure this all out and. Um, it's going to take a while because the whole thing's complicated, but, but you know, it, We're going to perhaps intentional. First have Chris and then Nellie here. Chris. Well, the question I have is this. A lot of these reserves came about because the Fed was buying securities. So I think I ought to pay the banks if I'm taking a security away from them. What's the net, though, Paul, between the cost of IOER and the forgiveness that the Fed is giving to the taxpayer by holding Treasury debt? Because you know, basically, that's that's a plus, right? Uh, it, the Fed does make more money on its Treasury portfolio than it pays banks. That's true. Um, but you know, for the since 1914 up until 2008, reserves were viewed as a tax, and that's why reserve requirements yes. were tiny. It was it's a sea change in that reserves actually became an asset, an earning asset, not not a tax. It's a whole. It's a whole change in, in, in the way you have to think about banking and, and what assets you hold. And I think all of your charts showed that banks realize this and are holding a lot more reserves or cash as, as it was in your charts. Right, but if they want to move out of that, they can certainly do so. 
There's nothing preventing them. But from they're paid. They're they're getting paid yeah, at an overnight rate that's almost equal to an annual rate on treasuries. Right. But if there's I, no interest rate risk, the if Fed. I, if I, right no. Hey, if hang I on. Fourteen percent gross yield on my credit card book. That's yeah. a pretty easy yeah. choice. Yes, Nellie wants to yeah. get in here. So I I would agree with Paul in the sense that there is really <laughs> no magic size for the size of a central bank balance sheet. Um, the Fed got into this in extraordinary policies. They have to have a certain size for required reserves. And you know the system has gotten bigger, so the balance sheet in the future will be expected to be a little bigger just because the system is bigger. There's required reserves of 10%, which has not changed for decades. Um, but it does, the, the concern, which is what I fully agree with, is it just puts the central bank into the political sphere. And that is, an issue, and over time, you know, they have, you know, their <coughs> their uh, extra they pay to the treasury. Up till now, I think between 2009 and now, they have paid the Fed has paid the treasury 550 billion dollars. In the next few years, some of that may go negative, and so on net, I don't know. To thinking about Chris's question, whether you, where you come out positive or negative on net, but the time series is gonna it will matter. Robert? I, don't, I, I think we're talking about the, the Fed and Treasury. We're talking about the federal government and how involved we want them to be in, or not be in the banking se sector. And, you know, I, I, don't, this, I don't agree that, that, that the Fed has to have a certain size balance sheet and that has to have a certain required reserves. The Fed is the, the only, under the fiat money system that we have, the Fed's the only one who can increase the reserves in the system or decrease the reserves in the system. We don't even have to have required reserves much less a bigger bed, uh, bigger balance sheet. They can still control the, the quantity of reserves without a required reserve because banks are still going to have to have balances to clear. So I, I don't I don't agree at all that that we have to have anything close to what we have. Other comments from the panel on the, that, oh, Chris. Just the biggest beneficiary of quantitative easing the easing is the federal government. So if we throw a few pennies back in the cup for the private banking industry. <laughs> what a shame. That, I can't believe I'm sitting on a panel with a bunch of free market advocates. We're sitting in a building that was created to fight fascism and economic uh, tyranny in this country after World War II. So come on, you know. All right, the chair allocates himself two minutes to put out a, a, an, alterna, an alternate uh, hypothesis here. Uh, Bert Ely, who's sitting right over here, always tells me, you have to understand the Fed and the Treasury are the same thing. It's just two different aspects of the consolidated government financial operation. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And that explains uh, why the Fed wants to decrease the, or has wanted to decrease the uh, federal deficit by buying a couple few trillion dollars of treasuries. And another piece of this consolidated government operation is the Fannie Freddie mechanism, and that explains why the Fed is financing to the tune of 1.8 or 9 trillion dollars of Fannie and Freddie mortgages. I think it's helpful to think about it all as one big government financial operation. And when you do that, you see what a hugely important uh, event it was, as the panel, uh, all I think the panel agree, uh, when uh, Ben Bernanke and the Fed, in a in a brilliant strategical political move got authority from the Congress, which they didn't have before, to pay interest on reserves. Um, and it does benefit the banks. I think Paul is right about that. But, but in my view, more importantly, it allows the Fed to be a much bigger element of the total government role in the financial system and to allocate resources. So you could think about what these excess reserves are doing is actually the banking system channeling its investments through the Federal Reserve to two favored, two favored sectors by political credit allocation. And the two sectors are housing through the Fed's gigantic mortgage portfolio and, of course, the government deficit uh, through the purchase of long-term treasuries my last point is to remind us, the Fed now owns zero, zero treasury bills. All its 
Treasury securities are long, and they're, they've taken, as Chris said, that duration out of the market to cut the cost to the government. Basically, the consolidated Treasury Fed Fannie Freddie uh, government financial operation is all funding itself short through deposits at the Fed and taking all the long funding out of the out of the market so that net it's all short funding that's the end of the chair's comments now i want to come to your questions ladies and gentlemen um i remind you the aei style please first of all wait uh, for the microphone uh, to reach you uh, when it does tell us your name and your affiliation and ask your question uh, if you feel an overwhelming desire which sometimes happens uh, at these events uh, to make a statement um, before your question, and, and that statement has a tendency to turn into a lecture, uh, after one minute, the chair will remind you that it's time to ask your question. Uh, and with that, the floor is open. I, there's a fellow way in the back here whom I have just cited, Bert Ely, and I want to give you a chance to ask first, Bert, because I was just, just quoting your excellent point about the uh, Consolidated government finances. Wait for the microphone to come, please. Uh, Bert Ely, a banking consultant. Alex took away a lot of my fire by uh, referencing the work that uh, that I've done and shared with him, and looking at the uh, at the Fed and Treasury uh, balance sheet on a combined basis. And then I think what you see, and this leads up to my question, is that essentially uh, since the crisis, the government has reduced uh, the average duration of uh, the outstanding federal debt, that is, federal debt held outside of uh, the, the Federal Reserve. My question for you all is this. Now that um, uh, the government, if you will, the Fed plus the Treasury, is in that position and has only just started to, uh, uh, shall we say, unwind that position, two-part question, number one, how, what are going to be the consequences for the financial markets generally and for the yield curve as uh, the Fed goes through that unwinding and more of this Treasury debt gets held by the public? And second of all, has the federal government made a long-term fiscal error by not using the uh, recent years of very low interest rates to uh, uh, issue long-term uh, low-cost treasury debt. How much more, how, how much uh, future interest expense is the government going to take on because of its uh, fact that it has not used this opportunity during its low rate period to really extend out the average maturity of its debt? Thank you. Who wants to take up either or both of those questions? Chris? Well, I think the answer to your second question is um, there's, you know, you still have the other central banks buying. And you've also created an enormous uh, dearth of uh, investment-grade assets. So I think the Fed could be selling, as I said before, they could sell all of their MBS over the next two years and keep the treasuries, which they want, for the portfolio. And I don't think it would have a lot of impact. Uh, short of big headline risk, uh, the curve, I think, is going to get flatter. Even if the Fed goes forward, stops reinvestment, starts selling overtly, uh, I really don't think it'll have much of an impact, Bert. But I do think the Treasury made a big mistake. You know, uh, Peter Fisher's decision is going to be long rude because why wouldn't you take advantage of 30-year debt, you know? Other views? I could uh, just make a different, um, just add it to this a little bit. Um, I guess I'm not fully, I don't fully agree that Treasury and Fed work in synchronous act work in combination here. Treasury, when it auctions debt, has a very different objective. They want to make sure they can auction their debt when they need to. And they have a specific maturity schedule and um, types of securities they want to sell. The Fed tried to reduce duration. That's not sort of the Treasury's mandate. Um, so you don't have, so I, I'm not sure we can answer your question because I don't actually think they work in coordination fully on this. They have different objectives. Anybody else, Paul? You have, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I, so they do have uh, 
uh, operational independence. That's true. Uh, but the framework that they've created endangers the hell out of that. Well, you look, the chief objective of the Board of Governors is keeping the Treasury market open before any other. <coughs> Safety and soundness of banks, you know, that's their chief objective as an institution. I, uh, I think Chris is right about that, and it goes back actually to the founding of the Bank of England in 1694, uh, which was a deal between the government of England uh, and the newly created bank, which is that if the bank would lend the government money, which is equivalent to buying treasuries, they would give them all kinds of privileges and monopolies, and that's been a pretty durable deal. It was helped out by the fact the royal family became shareholders in the Bank of England. Uh, historical note. Paul, do you have a view on the uh, what's going to happen if the Fed actually seriously starts reducing uh, purchases or even starts selling securities? I'll, I think I'll pass on that. Okay. No one wants to be on TV with a firm forecast. Uh, but I, th I think the uh, my own view is the market reaction to that in the terms of a, a rising uh, long-term rates could be uh, more severe than people are anticipating or believing. And I say that in spite of your point, uh, Chris, which is right, that the central banking fraternity uh, around all the major countries, which is a very tight fraternity, is all in this together. Well, as Nellie pointed out, that high yield spread, you know, the Fed has taken high yield spreads down almost two points. Uh, and, and that's the shift in credit. So until you see those spreads widen, I don't think you really have much chance for longer term rates to go out. Day over here, please. Hi, Thomas Ward. Um, first, I want to say, Alex, as a plug to um, AEI, tomorrow you got the housing conference tomorrow and the next day. So I think that's one thing to bring into this. Secondly, um, and Ed Pinto, will, who's sitting right up here, will answer all the housing finance questions that you have. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and you know, secondly, I think we should really think about what happened at Jackson Debt Hole because um, that's all about the debt. And you got the IMF World Bank meetings going on right now because you're looking at 40 trillion in debt around the globe. Plus, you've got 40 trillion in pensions that are in trouble. And going back to the series which you had going for a long time of the shadow. Um, Fed Reserve, much talk was about how the policies actually forecast what the next problem is going to be. And the fixes were actually the baseline for the next problem. Do you agree? Uh, do we agree that the fixes for the last problems tend to create the next problem? Norbert? Well, I, I don't know if it creates it, but it certainly sets it up to deal with it. Because what, you've, what they've done is they've divorced monetary policy from the balance sheet. I mean, that's, that's basically it. So they've got a system where they can keep buying stuff and keep using the interest to offset where that stuff goes. So if there's a pension crisis, great. We can buy that. I mean, you know, if there's a, a California bankruptcy, I don't know. I'm not saying that will happen, you know, but great. We can buy the bonds. Well, he said it. I mean, they, the, all of the agendas are driven by debt. You know, the Europeans are broke. So now you have Christine Lagarde going out there talking about SDRs, and my friend Jim Rickards is predicting that they're going to start overtly issuing them to indebted governments to use as ersatz money because they've run out of layers of leverage, if you will, going back to inflated, right? It's all about layers of leverage. So the question is, what's the new layer? And they haven't figured that out yet. But otherwise, you have default. I mean, if Mario Draghi stopped doing what he's doing, and actually allowed market rates in Europe to go up, you would see a lot of defaults. And they just will not tolerate that. So whatever gets them away from that is what they'll do. I'm going to wait for the microphone, please. I have this gentleman here, and then we'll come over to you, Ed. Uh, Rich Miller, Bloomberg. Maybe just a couple of quick questions. If the IOER is so attractive, why is it only the foreign banks that seem to be the ones who are parking their reserves? That suggests that maybe it isn't so attractive for the domestic banks. To what would the alternative have been to the, for the Fed to, to uh, you know, inflating, uh, doing QD, QE and inflating reserves? And three, to Bert's point, I mean, there was a lot of controversy, actually, that the Treasury was actively trying to lengthen the maturity of its debt while the Fed was actually taking uh, duration out. So they weren't working together by any means. No. All right. Uh, we got a three-part question. Who so wants to start? The the best uh, data I saw was that the 
half of the reserves are in the t top largest 25 domestic banks, and about a third of them are in the foreign banks. And so uh, it's not just foreign. You're right. You're right. It's not yeah. just foreign. It's not just foreign. There's there's plenty of, of large uh, U.S. banks that own a lot of reserves. Uh, the second question. What was the alternative? Oh, to paying IOER or to QE? I, I, yeah, I think. I don't. Th I don't think there's solid agreement anywhere that the QE actually stimulated the economy. Uh, I, th I think there's lots of people that think uh, at least the last version of it might have been a pretty big mistake. And you know, I don't. I think even the Fed itself, its internal research struggles to to look for uh, really clear benefits of the QE program. So um, th the answer might have been you let markets equilibrate. And, and and get out of get out of the crisis you know quicker um, rather you know find the equilibrium where the bottom is so people start buying stuff part of the part of the problem when you intervene and and there's all this in, you know government uh, this and that is people don't know where the real equilibrium price is and so if, if you never set the bottom you kind of can't you you can't you know get back to a normal growth trajectory because no nobody really knows what it was worth because somebody's supporting the price this this happens in all kinds of markets. You kind of have to clear the decks and, and, and get to an equilibrium. So I'll stop Other there. Other comments? Chris? If you think of QE1 as reliquifying the banking system, which they had to do because they didn't have the money to pay the Fed back, if they had stopped at that point, then what we would be talking about in terms of excess reserves would be much smaller, and the Fed wouldn't have this millstone around their neck. But they are tied to this worldview that comes out of 40, 50 years of just using price to manipulate credit demand in this country, price doesn't work anymore. So then they moved on to overtly intervening in the market the way we used to do with the Fed during the Plaza Accord. I, I date myself. But it's the same mentality. It's overt market intervention. And it, as Paul said, it didn't work. But they don't know what else to do. There's nothing in the playbook beyond that. So that's why the board has done this, even though it's very clear that Fed funds rate, other benchmark rates no longer cascade through the market. They don't really uh, push things anywhere near the external factors. It's not even close. So, you know, I think it's a structural problem with the Fed. They just don't have anywhere to go intellectually. So this is why they did it. And other you, comments? Yeah, if, if you go back and look at the first QE, too, I think, well, not I think, I know. I mean, you, you can read what they said. They sterilized everything. Maybe if they hadn't sterilized everything, they wouldn't have needed two and three. No, but but, but swelling reserves like that in that time frame, yeah. 10 was not a good year. No, uh, I, that helped. Uh, <laughs> that helped. And then they should have stopped. A, a way to summarize yeah. these comments is that you could do something temporary, but it's 10 years almost since the end of the crisis. Did we answer your third question? Thanks for the stimulating question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Fed was, uh, the Treasury was linked in maturity. Oh, yes. Said, and, then, and actually, there's been a lot of controversy about that, including uh, uh, Larry Summers, among other people, has raised this issue. Yeah, well, there's always uh, debates within families, you know. I have, uh, I have Ed Pinto next, and then we'll come back to you, sir. Right here, Mr. Pinto. Thank you, and thank you for the uh, hat tip for the conference tomorrow and Thursday on housing risk. Uh, so uh, two things were mentioned. One was the integrated balance sheet between the Fed and Treasury. And the other, I think, Alex, you said something about uh, deficit reduction through all the, uh, the money coming from the Fed. Isn't a better way or perhaps a different way of looking at it? And that uh, what the Fed did, combined with very low interest rates, was just allow Congress to borrow much more uh, in a way of deficits because it was so cheap to fund them due to the combination of low interest rates and the $500 billion that the Fed was giving over a period of five or six years. Uh, comments on that? Well, the net came from the housing market, if you look at the swings. And you've seen a, a, each year you see issuance go up. It's been record issuance for five years in the bond market, if you look at the, the SIFMA numbers. But it's corporates and treasuries today versus housing oh, finance. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's used for share repurchases. We're buying back $2 worth of equity for every dollar in new IPOs in the equity market. So there's no mystery. And all of these asset classes, going back to Michelle's point, are now correlated thanks to the Fed. This is great.
you know, we've never had this before. Every major asset class in the United States and, the, and globally is now correlated. If, if Other you look, comments? If yeah. you look at the flow of funds, Federal Reserve flow of funds, I mean, the, it, the government debt is what has taken off since 2008. Um, household debt, not so much. Corporate debt, not so much. In, in, in a lot of ways, they've moderated quite a bit. It's the government. The government has taken on the job of borrowing and replacing private sector debt growth. If you just look at the flow of funds numbers, it's it's right there. I think that I just would, agreed I with your point. Add, Go ahead, Nellie. No, I would, I would add. So the household and business credit to GDP numbers are exactly what I was showing. And you could see the households have come down from quite a bit, from like 80 to 60 percent. The businesses are are up. The government has risen. This is pretty typical of recessions and slow periods. There is some counter cyclicality in government spending, you know, just, but it, it has reached a new high. And I don't want to dismiss that it is a high level and is something to be uh, concerned about. But it's fairly frequent for government spending to go up when private spending falls the way our expenditures are. Others? Okay. I have this gentleman here, please. Uh, Aaron Klein Brookings, uh, one quick uh, comment and then a question. I think your government numbers may be accurate, but note that student loans, it's just a bookkeeping thing from pro quote unquote private, it was represented as private debt and bank debt with a 98% government guarantee, and now it's represented as government debt. So that $1.2 trillion, you should back out of your calculations in making that point, which you know, even in Washington, numbers over one trillion matter. Uh, the question I have, Paul, is a different counterfactual uh, from, from Rich's. I was in Congress when the Fed asked for authority on IOER, which was given without terribly much public debate. At the time, the balance sheet was so minuscule that the impacts that you're describing weren't contemplated. Uh, but it was asserted by the Fed that they needed this to switch from the point target to the bound target. If you go all the way back and run a counterfactual, say Congress didn't give them that authority and they had to run the point target through the crisis, how would that, how would we look different? So the original argument for interest on reserves was really interest on required reserves it, because required reserves had always been uh, discussed as a tax on banks and required reserves were actually tiny, $900 million. And the Fed originally sought power to pay interest on required reserves. And they did that for the first few weeks of, they wanted to pay a different rate. And then all of a sudden they went to the same rate on both of them in December 2008. So I don't think they ever, it was ever, it was supposed to offset the push there is in the financial system for deposits to go into money funds because money funds don't have a required reserve ratio. They don't have to pay deposit insurance premiums. And so for years, money funds had drained money, transactions type balances out of the banking system and the Fed sought to counteract that by paying some small amount of interest on reserves. It was never meant to be, or was never intended back then to be the monetary policy target. All through the 90s, in fact, um, the Fed had done things like, without any changes in the law, reduced required reserves that banks had to ha held by having these sweep accounts that swept things that had required reserves overnight into things that didn't have required reserves. So the Fed had, for many, many years, tried to reduce, actually, the, the burden of required reserves on banks. So uh, in terms of the counterfactual going forward, I don't know. The bank, I, I, can, I can tell you if the Fed wasn't paying any interest on reserves, the bank Banks wouldn't have $2.35 trillion parked at the Fed right now. I pretty much guarantee that. But, uh, the, but the Fed won't, the reserves won't disappear until they sell the securities. Yeah. They're never destroyed. I mean, they are tied to those assets. So what would happen? They, they would turn into other assets under the classic theory of the reserve multiplier, which, yeah, we'd have massive which paying, in, and you'd have massive inflation, which paying interest on reserves cuts out the classic theory Hmm. of the reserve hmm. multiplier. And that's a hugely, fundamentally important change which was made. I think, as Aaron, you said, without a whole lot of, of discussion or knowledge of what was really going on. Other comments? I, I, I think it would have forced it to be temporary. That's what, I think, that's what I think it would be different about it. I think, in other words, the operations that they undertook would have been a normal, we need to flood the market with liquidity and get it out as quickly as we can. There wouldn't have been an incentive to keep something like this in place. There wouldn't have been the, the economic incentives to keep it in place. 
Well, it would have without out. without the the higher interest on excess reserves. But they okay. would have sold the reserves and bought securities, so it would drive yields down. Maybe. We'll see. So one of the reasons for wanting to pay interest on reserves, and they asked for it early 2008, before the crisis and before the size of the balance sheet was that if you're not paying interest on required reserves, banks were taking all these actions every single night to move all kinds of funds around so that it's costly to hold things if you're not getting interest. So, you know, there's just like all these unnecessary actions every night to make sure you meet, met your required reserves and still weren't paying a penalty. So I think, you know, that was the reason for the request at the time. Um, but that was a day before the balance sheet got very big, and so it's worth considering. It was, it was actually right pa passed in a law earlier, 2006, That's I think, yeah, and, and they it got it accelerated in the TARP bill. Uh, but yeah, it was never intended to be a, yeah. a tool to set interest rates, monetary policy interest mm -hmm. rates. It wasn't never they've intended been, that. Yeah, and they've been arguing about that, actually, for, uh, for decades. I mean, I actually contemplated putting that in when they did the Federal Reserve Act. Treasury actually fought paying interest on reserves, historically. For the very reason Paul mentioned. Yeah. I have a question right here, please. Thank you. Barry Wood, RTHK in Hong Kong. Can't you make the case that Federal Reserve policy has been spot on since the crisis in terms of QE, really saving us from a very catastrophic situation, and that the move towards normalization is appropriate. And I sense that at least uh, you, Chris, think that um, the, the last couple QEs were inappropriate. I wonder what you think the proper course of Fed action is going forward. Well, QE1 declares success, spreads come in, and, you know, I'm in the school that spreads are all that matter. I think that's what Chairman Bernanke uh, believed. He was horrified by QE. He wanted to describe it as large-scale asset purchases, and they came up with another name <laughs> institutionally because that was unacceptable. <laughs> um, and I, I really believe that if the point is to get the markets functioning again, there's a whole raft of monetary policy and prudential policy actions that should not have been taken. But we never get policymakers in a room, maybe with the chairs and the you know, minority uh, leaders of the different parties who are responsible, and we talk and say, what do we want? So everything is piecemeal, and it's the net, net, net that really matters for the economy, right? So today, I would tell you there's less leverage in the economy, there's less growth as a result, and yes, we have safer banks, but we've turned them into islands. They don't trade with each other because we're afraid of the market. We're afraid of what the market might tell us, right? So that's our solution. We don't have a market anymore. And you know, I, I think there's another way to do it, but they didn't have the courage to start reversing some of the decisions which have been made for 20 years, to be fair, right? So what do you do? Other comments? The, um, the, the strategy that Chair Yellen and, and, and the board have put forward is very, very slow, very deliberate strategy. Uh, they hope that it is so boring that no market reacts. Um, that's their best hope. Uh, if, if there is some kind of financial meltdown, I think that'll test whether they're going to keep going forward with the strategy or they revert to QE. But I mean, it's meant to be boring. It's, it, it's going to take a long time to get the balance sheet down uh, uh, to its long run equilibrium size. And I don't even think they've decided what that is yet. Currencies currencies are twice what they were in 2008, so the balance sheet's got to be bigger than, they, they're, they're thinking they like the IOR or IOER, I don't know why they ease anymore, because they pay interest on all reserves. They think they like that strategy. I've Dudley's given speeches that said, well, it's really easy for us to do. We don't have to do all this bond buying day in and day out. It's just really simple. So, and to do that, they think they want like a trillion, he, he's mentioned a trillion dollar balance sheet. I don't think any of this is settled yet. I, th I think there will be political backlash eventually, and they'll have to rethink this and in, in, in how they want to actually manage reserves and, and, and set interest rates. And um, there is no federal funds market anymore. Um, you know, if they want one, they're going to have to get reserves way down where excess reserves are really valuable and people are willing to bid for them and trade them again. And we're, not, we're, we're, we're years away from that uh, under the current plan. And they are still buying. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's just buying. They're, still, they're, buying. they're, they're still buying. They're still buying. They're just letting so, it roll off slowly. Uh, yeah, they're still eight years after the end of the crisis. Go ahead, Noah. Right. Um, so in terms of whether the financial sector is, you know, financial stability, and there's always this concern, you don't want stability of the graveyard. I mean, this has been a comment. But I guess I just have a slightly different perspective. I look at the banks, and um, their stock prices have risen quite a bit. In the U.S., the price book ratios are like 1.5 for some of the biggest ones, and you know, Bank of America and City are closing on one, but they've always been sort of laggards. Um, so one doesn't. But I don't, growth, debt growth is seven, eight percent a year. So maybe it could be nine or ten. But you know, how much debt growth is sustainable for the private sectors? So you wanna? It is. I. I'm not seeing the. You know, on the one hand, we see massive corporate bond issuance. Um, we're seeing loan growth. We're seeing banks that are viable, so I'm not, I'm not seeing the same sort of graveyard view that Chris sometimes mentions. Well, look, it's very simple. They have negative risk-adjusted returns. The, bit, the little guys make money. That's the difference between banks. All right, I have another next question over here, please. Hi, uh, Carl Pulzer, Center on Capital and Social Equity. I hope this isn't too much of a madcap question, but given the increased intertwining between the Treasury and the Fed and the increased possibility that Congress will use the Fed in a political way, the question of Social Security's future, that it's facing a financial shortfall of like 20 years from now when the boomers move through, it's gonna only be raising about 75% of, from the workforce of what it needs to pay out. Is there a possibility that the Fed could come into play in some financial restructuring with long-term low interest credit? I mean, could that be? I'm, I'm just a, it's a Gedanken question, I guess. I think it's a very good question, thank you. How about uh, extreme monetary policy uh, and its effects on, the, on Social Security and how might that play out? Uh, if the Fed free, needs, free association If, if the question, Treasury needs you. cash, the Fed will buy the paper. Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. yeah. They've already tasted the forbidden fruit. <laughs> agree. We, we, we agree completely on that. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Others? Hey, the next question is pensions in general after, uh, after Social Security. Okay, other questions? If there aren't any more questions. Oh, yes, right here. Uh, Al Deal, Deal Global Associates. Mine is a crystal ball um, uh, question <laughs> asking you to, to, to consider. Given the current state of political affairs in the, in the U.S. and the fact that there's a, a prospective change in the Fed chairmanship, uh, do you expect, or, or I'd, I'd appreciate your opinion as to whether or not you think uh, what already is a close association between Treasury and the Fed could potentially become even more uh, entwined uh, depending on who the next Fed chairman might be? Good question. Uh, Comments? I, yeah, I don't think it matters. The, the Fed is the alter ego of the Treasury, both Bertie Ely, uh, Bob Eisen, Bice, at Cumberland Advisors, who was head of research at the Atlanta Fed. You know, he's laid it out. The, 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 the Congress doesn't make money from the Fed. It's an expense. You know, they get back to Treasury's money less the Fed's operating costs. And the CFPB, too, by the way. Uh, that's it. So, that's, yes. That's changed by mortgages, Chris. 1.8 trillion of mortgages. Well, yeah. We're, we're, that's we're, why you have we're to We're subsidizing Fannie and Freddie. That's right. Other, other points I'll, about new chairman of the Fed? Relation yeah. between Fed and Treasury or any other yeah, part I, of the, the government? I mean, the current administration seems to be somewhat unorthodox, to put it nicely so I mean I, I don't know it's hard to say but um, I mean historically the, this this notion of Fed independence doesn't hold up I mean it, it just doesn't yes Volcker comes along and does something different okay and yes there's sort of this this goal, this aura of, of operational independence and a degree of operational independence but over the long haul they're not independent you remember what the former Fed Chairman Arthur Burns said, which was, we can't exercise our independence or else we might lose it. Lose it. 
other, I, before I give Bert a second chance, other questions? Okay. Wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you, Bert Ely, again. Uh, this comes back to the Fed and uh, new appointments to the board. Uh, Randy Quarles has just been confirmed to be vice chairman for supervision. Uh, this, of course, is a result of uh, Dodd-Frank. Uh, what are your thoughts as to what, is, is there going to be uh, an increased emphasis on supervision and how is that going to uh, interact uh, with, uh, with monetary policy now that supervision has to some extent been elevated by virtue of having this new vice chairman for supervision? Well, you want to take that? Uh, I suspect supervision will be de-emphasized <laughs> Oh, uh, compared to the Torillo years. Um, one of the big problems with the Dodd-Frank Act, in my opinion, is that so many of the powers and regulations are not very tightly cons conscribed. Uh, you can do you, huge, they're huge, it, you can be pedal to the metal under one administration and full, full on the brakes the next administration, depending on who's in charge. The, the, they're just not that, it doesn't constrain the regulators enough. You don't really know what the law requires them to do, and I suspect the pendulum will swing from the Trillo years. Um, we're all, uh, will, we, will we have the, you know, the uh, financial crisis that some of my colleagues predict has been imminent for the last four years uh, every week? <laughs> um, it, yeah, eventually we will. Um, we'll, you know, uh, the bank, the banks are probably less exposed now than they were, but but two three years from now, after this change in regime, who knows? We could, we could it could it could end up badly. Um, uh, any financial crisis would end up badly. But uh, I think I think we're in for a change. I think the pendulum is swinging. Um, I think part of the reason, and I think the Democrats will probably come around to understanding this when there's a new CFPB chairman who's a Republican who doesn't, you know, undoes all the things the last guy did and it's all because there's so much wiggle room in all these laws is that they're going to grow to dislike the Dodd-Frank Act uh, when the Trump people, if, if he ever does nominate anybody for half these positions, if they ever get put in power, I think, I think it will come full circle that they'll decry it and how, how are you doing this and uh, the same thing you heard from the Republicans when people thought uh, the last administration was way too strict. So it'll come full circle, I think. Other comments? Chris? Yeah, I think it's already underway. The, the enormous leeway that Paul referred to in terms of guidance and implementation of statutes is very powerful. It's being led by Treasury in cases where there's no appointee in place. Treasury just does it uh, with OMB via fiat. But it's going to manifest itself uh, in reduced costs, both for banks and for non-banks, especially in the mortgage world. When uh, Richard Cordray leaves office, there's going to be a big party on the mall uh, because he, he increased the cost for lending and servicing and one of four family mortgages by you know 300 percent. Um, and there are many, many firms that are on the verge of failure in the FHA market today. And the hurricane, I got to tell you, has not helped. There's been a whole series of interest rate shocks and external shocks from weather uh, that are going to decimate that market. And I think people are going to have to pay attention to this. You know, we have to actually t sit down with the regulators and figure out a way to make money. Because for the last eight years, it was all punishment. They weren't concerned whether the industry could actually make money. So I think that's a big change. And it'll be, it won't make revenues grow, but earnings will be better. So other comments? Okay. Other questions? Hearing none, we thank you all for coming very much for the great questions you asked, and let's thank the panel. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it.